Taking Control of Your Finances with Chelsea Williams, episode 130. Are you ready to make your law firm a profit generating machine that will free up your time and skyrocket your impact? With more than two decades of business growth experience and having proven that you can be successful while prioritizing your family and your impact, introducing the Profit with Law podcast. I am your host, the creator of the firm differentiator 10x effect, Moshe Amsel. Well, hello and welcome to another great guest interview here on the Profit with Law podcast. And today I have a special guest that we cross paths on the interwebs in um, in one of the legal Facebook groups. And I was impressed with some of the things that she was sharing from a financial perspective. There's not a lot of people who, uh, when they talk about accounting, tax, finance um, publicly, actually know what they're talking about and say things that are true and correct. Uh, so when I saw uh, in relation to PPP, what she was sharing with the community, I said, okay, this person has their stuff together. They know what they're talking about. We should really chat. We started talking on Messenger and it was a no brainer to bring her here on the podcast. My guest today is Chelsea Williams. Uh, Chelsea Williams is a ladypreneur, lady entrepreneur. Uh, her, uh, her values are to uh, go and help the, the female legal community. And uh, we'll dive into that when we talk today. Uh, but she's successfully built and, and, and run uh, two uh, businesses related to accounting, tax, financial management. And I'm really excited to dive into some of that today. Uh, and hopefully you will be able to glean some takeaways that will help you with making your business more profitable. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to say hello to Chelsea. Chelsea, welcome to the show. Hello, everyone, and thanks for having me. Awesome. So Chelsea, I like to start with, you know, people on the other side of this conversation are like, who the heck is this person? Where did she come from? So can you give us some background? Like, how did you get into what you do? And how did you get into serving the legal community? Um, and, you know, just give us some, some broad strokes as to in your backstory so that we can get to know a little bit more about you. Absolutely. Um, and that's a question I get all the time. And I don't know about you. And the great thing is, folks, that Moshe and I are in the same space, um, but we both have an abundance mindset. We're both here to serve and we both understand that there's plenty to go around. Um, and so I don't know about you, but I get asked that question all the time. Like, why on earth would you choose willingly to deal with lawyers? Because there's this stigma uh, around attorneys. And you know, it really goes back to uh, the first time I ever learned about money. The first time somebody actually took a moment to sit down and look me in the eye and say, this is money and this is how it works and this is what you need to know. And it came from a city bus driver. So my friend and I were in, where well, it was our freshman year of high school and we took the city bus to the mall. And on our way back out of nowhere, this bus driver was like, you two, take out a pen and take out some paper. We're gonna talk about what it means to be independent financially. And me and my friend are looking at each other like, what the heck is going on? What is this guy, we don't even know you, what are you doing? And he had us go through and list rent, utilities, groceries, uh, fun money, car payment, fuel. I mean, this is the first time, and I was 15, anybody sat down and taught me about money. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it was a moment that is really one of the pillars around why I do what I do. And that is, it boils down to financial literacy, which no one is teaching. Our children aren't learning it in school. They're not learning it in high school. Attorneys are not learning it in law school. So for the attorney that chooses to go and hang their own shingle, not having that component in any business, not just in a law firm, can really make or break you. And so I've been in the tax and accounting world for over 10 years now. And one of the things that I realized immediately is that it was a very reactive service that we were, that we were providing. You know, we weren't being very proactive about planning and strategizing when it comes to money management and taxes. So when I founded Core Solutions Group three years ago, 
I was looking for a niche because I, I know that I wanted to be in a niche, right? And when I was looking at the landscape of the legal industry, um, there are definitely some unique needs for law firms, things like trust accounting that require expertise and knowledge around that. But there's also a lot of mindsets um, around attorneys that own their own law firm that are completely understandable, but that are also holding them back. And so I really fell in love with, you know, working with attorneys and more recently launching my second company, LP3, which is Lady Panures in, in pursuit of passion, purpose, and profit. Um, because, you know, money mind blocks again, women and the history that we have with money produces um, different mind blocks that we have to face and get through. So, you know, all in all, um, I'm really happy with the, the people that I work with. And again, it's my heart mission to really get out there and teach some financial literacy to entrepreneurs and help them to grow and scale and not have to worry about the money piece. Awesome. So uh, very interesting story with the bus driver. And um, I mean, it's, it's wild um, that, you know, he felt compelled to do that with you. Like, you know, what, why, I wonder how many other uh, teenagers he gave the same lesson to. I asked um, myself the same question. <laughs> but you never, you never know where that inspiration is going to come from. You never know who, you know, when a stranger may change your life. And it, it's almost like a lesson for us. Like, you know, we, we don't realize how, how many opportunities we walk past every day to mentor somebody else with something that we know. Um, and we just let it pass by uh, because what, you know, would I ever, you know, stop a kid and say, hey, let me teach you a lesson and, and take them through, you know, a, a lesson of, you know, teaching them financial management? Probably not. And, you know, so it's an eye opener for me as, as somebody who is trying to influence the world in a positive way, that I probably have a lot more opportunities than, than, uh, than I realize that are just passing me by every day, you know, just in the regular routine that we go through. So uh, very interesting, interesting story. Uh, so, Chelsea, I want to jump into right into this financial conversation because it's obviously uh, your you know your area of expertise. What is the number one um, lack of understanding that you find law firm owners have when it comes to their um, financial management or financial acumen in their business? I have to say that I think the number one thing that I notice is honestly avoidance of it altogether. Um, you know, not keeping the books or having someone keep the books, but never looking at them or looking at them and never actually using them. Um, and so without, you know, financial clarity around your, what your position is in your business, it's just so hard to, to grow and scale and to understand what needs to happen. Um, and, you know, another thing that I see, and you probably see this too, is that attorneys aren't really understanding where their money is coming from and how much it costs them to generate that revenue and understanding the different types of costs associated with that revenue, right? Fixed or variable costs, um, you know, like revenue goes up, payroll goes up, rent doesn't go up, that's a fixed cost. And it really comes back to that, you know, that financial literacy, understanding the different types of revenue and expenses and how they affect each other so that you can properly plan. Yeah. So what I really want to uncover here is um, how are they managing before, you know, let's just talk about your clients, right? How are they managing before they come into your world and how, and what does their world look like after they're done working with you? Uh, I imagine that uh, you're not necessarily getting people who are bouncing checks left and right. Um, maybe you are but somehow they're using some sort of ad hoc system to manage their cash flow, but it's at the same time hampering their success. So can you portray that picture a little bit more? Like what are they doing what, um, as a practice when they first enter your world? And then what are those bad behaviors that you identify and, and why is that the thing that's holding them back from their success? That, uh, that is a good question. Um, most of the attorneys that come to us, and this, this plays into you know, the psychology around a law firm owner, you go to law school and you are 
built up to be this legal warrior, um, you know, which leaves you with a certain mindset. And then to go into business for yourself and realize that I should probably ask for help. It can be difficult to step forward, especially when, you know, here you are, you're this attorney, you are intelligent, you are credentialed. Some of you are making a real difference and change in this world, but your financials are in shambles. And so there's this kind of shame around that. And so it's hard to step forward. But then once you finally do, things can really change. So most people that come to us, you know, they are doing what most of us do, which is log into the bank account and look at my balances and like play out some numbers in my head and I'll check next week and see how it went, right? They've got five credit cards. They can't log into one. There's just no clarity around it. Um, and again, a lot of it has to do with not really wanting to face the numbers. Some, some attorneys are, you know, I'm, I know I'm not charging enough or, you know, I'm fine. There's always money in the bank. So why should I care any more than that? Um, but when working with someone with your cash accounting and taxes, what you're getting is fi not only financial clarity, but financial direction. So we are really big about making the financials actually useful. That's like our number one thing that we do right away. And that's the chart of accounts, which is an accounting term, but it boils down to what, how does your financial describe your income and expenses? What are the name of the accounts? And so, for example, one of the things I see nine and a half out of 10 attorneys that come to us, they will have a P&L and it's got legal fee revenue at the top, right? There's one line item for that. And so we're looking at the financial and we're like, awesome, you made $2 million last year. That's great. But where did it come from? And so getting very specific about your financials and, you know, not just saying legal fee revenue, but listing out each matter type so that you know where your money is coming from, because that is financial clarity. Now the strategy comes in, in the follow-up, right? In studying your numbers and learning the, the swings over time, or if there's seasonality, it's not just a one and done, you know? And then another thing, you know, that we see a lot, and I'm sure you do too, I have this conversation quite often and everybody laughs, but when we go through the budgeting process, software is just this line item and there's this, this thing of shiny object syndrome um, in, in spending a lot of money on software as a band-aid. So, you know, managing money is not just about having financial clarity. There's habits that go into it. There's mindsets and a business owner, as a business owner, our businesses are only going to grow as much as we are willing to grow personally. So having financials isn't enough, but actually following up with them and learning how to read them and even more importantly, being able to see what's coming down the pipeline can be so powerful for any business owner. Yeah, I love that you that you went into um, all of that. Um, the the thing that you described of logging into your bank account, checking your bank balance, and just figuring out that you're not going to go into the negative and you've got enough to cover everything. Um, you know, I, I'm I'm a, a big believer in in profit first and Mike McCallowitz, and he describes that as bank balance accounting. And it's basically this cash management system that, that people intuitively use because you're bringing your habits from your personal life over into your business. And what happens with your personal life is that's what you're, that's what you're doing. Now, maybe you're a, a statement kind of person. So you're only going month to month looking at your statement and seeing what your balance is. But today's day and age, we have access to our bank account online. We can do it on our phone. Um, I, as a matter of fact, I'm sure that there are some people who, you know, wake up every morning, check what's going on in their bank account and then go about their business. Um, and that, that, you know, that, that way of, of, uh, of existing um, is really reactionary. And then if you look at the rest of your business, we, t we, we tend to run our entire business in reactionary mode. So in other words, um, you get an email that drives the next action that you're going to take. Instead of you deciding beforehand, this is what I'm going to do next. You read the email and this client wants something or whatever. And all of a sudden you're going to drop everything else. and You're going to respond to that client. You're going to take care of that thing that might derail you for a half hour. You do that a bunch of times through the day, take an email, take a phone call, a staff member. And before you know it, you've been very busy all day long, but you've done nothing to move your business forward. So what I think that 
having your finances in order helps you do is it helps you get to the point where you can actually think about planning your future. And that's the, the missing component that I think is not spoken about that, that really needs, you know, we run a, a, a group coaching program called the 90 day law firm turnaround. And in that program, um, our attorneys spend 90 days turning around their law firm, which is why we called it that, right? Um, and in that program, one of the things that we do is we spend a lot of time in forecasting where you want to go. Like, what does that look like financially for you to get to this end destination? So if 12 months from now, you want to be taking home a quarter of a million dollars, and right now you're taking home 50 or worse, many law firm owners are not taking home nothing. So, oh, I'm, I've got a very successful business. I've got $2 million in revenue with $2 million in expenses. We're not losing any money. Yeah, but you got nothing to show for it. all of that work and all that staff and everything. And you should be able to show a lot for it. So uh, what we do is we create this forecast, but then we have to talk about the way that you operate daily. And one of the things that I do, and I don't have it on my desk. Actually, do I have it on my desk here? I do. Um, we have a, a planner um, that a friend of mine alone, David, created. It's called the 90X Goal Planner. For those of you on audio, I'm just holding this up for the video here. Um, and what this planner does is it allows you to map out your day based on your main goals. So every day it's got the, you, it, you know, this is the big version. So I use the, the action planner, which is the smaller version. The big one has five goals. And basically every day there's five, one through five at the top and then your to-do list. So what you do is, is you, you map out your, your main goals for the quarter that you want to do for your business. And then you make sure that you, you boil that down into your monthly goals and then into your weekly goals. And what happens is, is that by getting into the habit of attacking the action that is going to work towards your goal first, instead of being reactionary, is go, that's gonna, what's going to help you succeed. That's going to help you get to where you want to go. Without that kind of purpose and direction, you're, gonna, you're never going to change. You're going to end up staying in the same thing. So it starts and ends with the cash conversation because without knowing where you are today from a cash perspective, you can't create that future, right? You can't look at what's the plan to get there because I have no idea. I don't know where I'm starting from. And without knowing whether you're successful or not, without being able to measure the, you know, how you're doing with that cash management and knowing what the end result was, there's no way to know if you arrived. So knowing, having a system, an organized system around your money and knowing where you are is integral to being able to, to meet your goals. Um, so uh, I think that, you know, first accepting and understanding that what I'm doing right now is not working and, and is probably failing me. In other words, it, it, you, it, you can do, you can, you can exist as an entity for 20 years and never achieve the life that you've wanted. Or you can take one year of being organized and have what you want. And so, you know, when people realize this and they're like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it took me five years to get here. I can't believe it took me 10 years to get here. Um, you know, it, it suddenly clicks and, you know, now you're rocking and rolling. Um, so you gotta, you gotta switch from being reactionary to being planned. And that's, you know, that's what I think is, is the key. And what we're talking about here with Chelsea is being planned from, you know, on the financial side. So somebody comes into your world, they, you know, they're not planned. They're doing this bank balance accounting. Their books are probably in disarray. They probably don't have a bookkeeper. They've been trying to do it themselves, but they hate doing it. They're not good at doing it. So they just avoid it completely. What is, what is the process that you follow with a new client to get them organized to, and to, to educate them uh, enough that they understand what's going on? Yeah, and you know, this is such a good conversation. It, it revolves around the idea of what got you here won't get you there, right? And in order yep. to get to a different level, what we're really talking about is not so much the money. The money's the motivator, right? But this is your mental blocks and your habits that create the change that is going to be necessary in order for you to get to the next level. 
Um, you know, you talked about setting goals and, and reverse engineering those goals. One of the things that I love about numbers and what we do is that there, okay, there is such a thing as garbage in, garbage out, right? You control that with SOPs, standard operating procedures, but the numbers don't lie. The numbers that come out on the other end don't lie. You cannot manipulate them. You can't convince them to change. And there's a lot of power in that. And once, once, you know, law firm owners see their numbers on black and white and like your 90 day program, I can't imagine how many aha moments that you have witnessed when they're staring the numbers in the face and seeing, oh crap, that's real. That feeling that was in my gut when I go to sleep at night and can't sleep, that's really happening. However, there's also power in being able to forecast it into these goals and see it work out on pen and paper. That's motivating, right? Um, so yeah, and I, and I think that, you know, what, what you and I do and the answer to, you know, how to deal with numbers and outsourcing and understanding, it really does boil down to SOPs, right? You're just relying on somebody else's SOPs. One of the things about attorneys that is kind of unique is that in all but a few states, in order to own and operate your own law firm, you have to be a licensed practicing breadwinner. That requires your time. So the whole 80-20%, 80% of your time on your business, 20% in, it's really hard for attorneys to get to that place because they are required to be involved to a certain degree in their practice. And so the idea of delegation is even more important um, for attorneys, which again goes back to mindset and mind blocks, being not being able to, to pass things off. And so when people first come to us, uh, we have an onboarding process that is pretty defined. Uh, the first step is seeing where you are. And maybe that includes compiling a couple of years because you've been neglecting the books. I mean, we've seen so many messes and people apologize all the time. I'm so sorry, it's in shambles. And it's like, okay, we're nerds. We live for this stuff. We love it, <laughs> right? Um, so getting financial clarity around where they are currently and making sure they're up to date with everything is really important. But then the next phase that we go into is really setting up the chart of accounts and getting an understanding around how can I categorize my revenue and expenses in a way that it gives me the most information without cluttering my income statement. And that's where, you know, we, uh, nobody wants to work for work's sake. So a, a lot of attorneys are on a practice management system which produces reports that can then be integrated into the books and it's a very efficient process. But, you know, lining out the chart of accounts to get very specific about the information that you want to see on your financials um, is super important. And we also love the Profit First. I feel like you and I could geek out over Profit First all day. I absolutely love it. Um, I love Mike Michalowicz. His cheesy sense of humor is like right up my alley. So I love reading all of his books. Um, but we work with clients to, you know, get set up on that system as well. And the beauty behind that system is it's stress-free. It's hassle, hassle-free, right? If your, if your percentages are accurate, you, your cash is moving and going to where it needs to be without you really having to be involved. And that is the cause of a lot of stress for business owners, just knowing if the money's there. So now that we have this financial clarity in the financials, we have this cash management system. Now the next question is, okay, I have these really cool financials that are giving me a lot of information, but what now? And that's where, you know, you talking about goals and reverse engineering your goals. Uh, one of the worksheets that we use the most is the profitability per practice area worksheet. And, you know, for clients that are wanting to go through this exercise, we break down their margins per matter type. It's also, it's a multifunctional tool. It can be used to help you establish flat fees as well. But when you understand the different types of money that are coming into your firm and the time and cost, because a lot of people forget about time, right? They're like, I'm gonna make all this money. Oh, but I gotta work 70 hours a week. So now I don't have time to spend it. So time is super important um, and something that should be considered. So when you uncover these formulas um, based on your different revenue streams, now you have the power to forecast in the future. And that answers questions like, when do I hire, right? Who do I hire? So now we have the gift of foresight in your business to where you can see Q2, if everything goes according to plan, I need to hire another paralegal. 
right? That is on purposeness. That is the opposite of reactive. Absolutely. Um, so folks, if you don't know what Profit First is, you can uh, order the book on Amazon. Uh, we're going to link that up in the show notes. I think it's profitwithlaw.com forward slash Profit First or maybe Profit First book. So let me just, uh, I think it's Profit First book. I'll put it in my browser real quick. Nothing like on the fly uh, checking here, but yes, um, profitwithlaw.com forward slash Profit First book. I also have two um, episodes that I did way back when at the early stages of this podcast, and you can go to profitwithlaw.com forward slash 016 and profitwithlaw.com forward slash 018 if you wanna have a uh, just a primer on Profit First. I've also recently, um, uh, we've recently repurposed those episodes, episode 111 and 113, um, and also interviewed, uh, let's see, we interviewed uh, episode 116, was Brandon Osterbind. Uh, we interviewed him about, uh, he implemented, implemented Profit First in a contingency practice, which is a very different uh, financial model that you would think might not work with Profit First and it worked really well for him. So um, definitely go check those out if you're like, what the heck is Profit First and you wanna know more about it. Um, the other thing is, is I recently did an episode on what I call back of the napkin um, planning. And, you know, as we're talking about understanding your numbers, having a forecast, having a direction that you want to go, uh, it's important to understand that you don't need to have these fancy tools or, you know, do all this work in QuickBooks or whatever it is that your accounting, you know, uh, books are located in. Um, you can literally, and I called it back of the napkin planning because it's kind of like, you know, when, when two friends get together at the bar and they, and they come up with an idea, you know, oh, I've got this great idea that's going to make us a million bucks. You take the bar napkin, you take out a pen and you literally sketch out the numbers, the rough numbers. Okay. What, what, how many of these can we sell? What can we price it at? Okay. That's our revenue. And then what's it going to cost us to produce? And you just throw a couple of numbers on the napkin. And if you're positive at the bottom and it's enough money to make you rich, great. Let's get, let's get together. You shake hands on it and a partnership is formed. So um, that's where the name comes from. But basically I go through this process where you can really do this basic math to check is my business model a good business model? Does it work? Uh, can I afford to bring that next person on? Uh, do I need to increase my pricing? You know, those are things that can easily come to the forefront when you do this exercise. So check it out, episode 121, Back of the Napkin and Other Planning Tips. Uh, that's profitwithlaw.com forward slash 121. Um, so just wanted to give you a few of those resources because we, you know, we, when you have 120 some odd episodes at the time that, that uh, Chelsea and I are recording this, um, you know, it, there's a lot of material that we've already created and covered that you can access, you know, free of charge. Just, you know, give me, you know, 30 to 60 minutes of your time for each of those. And you could even listen on one and a half speed, two speed nowadays. You know, my wife, she hates it when I do it. So I have to put headphones in, um, but I, I cannot listen at one X anymore. Like I need to listen at this fast, fast speed because I don't have time for people to take their time to gather their thoughts, talk slowly so everybody can hear them. You know, I want to hear it quickly, get the information in and, and move on. Uh, with my life. And so if you're like that, you definitely can breeze through this, this material really quickly. Uh, but I love what Chelsea's sharing is that, uh, you know, you need to know where you're at, you need to know where you're headed, and you need to have clarity. So keeping things simple in the chart of accounts, making sure that it's readable, that you understand what it means, um, you know, is a really good starting point. Now, Chelsea, what, do you do you deal with tax as well? I, I know it's, you mentioned it a couple of times. Is, are, are you a, a tax preparer or your firm, um, a tax planner? What, what do you do with tax? We do do tax. Tax is not my cup of tea. Um, I understand mm -hmm. it enough to be dangerous, but we do have uh, tax preparers on staff. Got it. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna uh, dive too deeply into tax with you if it's not your cup of tea, but in, in a nutshell, can you just talk about the kinds of um, mistakes that people might be making when it comes to tax that really um, highlight how important it is from that perspective to be organized and to know what's going on? 
one of the things, one of the ideas that I founded Core Solutions Group on is that, you know, accounting is not the only piece that you need. Yeah, it's really important, but there are a lot of other things that you need to be successful in business ownership. And one of those ideas is bringing all of your key financial players to the same table. And what I mean by that is most of the time, the tax preparer is not talking to the financial planner, is not talking to the accountant, is not staying on the same page as you know the retirement planner. None of these people are talking. They're kind of going in different directions. And here's what taxes usually look like for business owners, right? Um, the accounting firm reaches out to you November, December and says, hey, get ready. Uh, tax season is coming and you're like, okay, it's fine. It's not until, you know, March or April or whatever the case is for you. And then last minute, you're shuffling to get everything together. You shove it to the tax preparer. And the next day you call like, are you done yet? Is it done yet? Right. Um, and on the other end, what's happening is this kind of mill style churn tax returns out, focus on one year, and most clients say, I just don't want to pay taxes, right? Whatever you got to do, I just don't want to pay taxes. We're looking at one year at a time. And I think that is the biggest mistake that business owners are making in tax preparation. They are looking at it one year at a time. Their only concern is not paying taxes. And the alternative to that is, you know, there's a quote um, by Judge Leonard Hand, I want to say, that says there are two tax systems in America. One for the informed and one for the uninformed. Both are legal. Taxes can be strategic and a lot of people don't understand that. There's a reason why these huge corporations can flip profits and not pay, pay taxes legally. And so understanding the difference between, again, the theme of our, one of the themes of our conversation is reactive, reactive planning, reactive movement going about your business. Preparing taxes one year at a time is reactive. And then of course you always ask the question, well, what else can I do? Is there anything I can do? And now we're already in March, April of the next year. And it's like, well, no, that, that year is over. So, you know, I think that um, taxes are, can be uh, an, an intimidating thing, a scary thing. People want to avoid it. They don't want to pay it. They also don't want to get in trouble. But there is so much potential around the way that you strategize your taxes, not just for your business, but for your personal life and not just for this year, but for the next three to five years. And if that's not something that your tax preparer is doing uh, with you currently, it's a conversation worth initiating. Yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, I wanna highlight a few things. So first of all, there's a difference between a tax preparer and a tax planner. And not every tax preparer does tax planning. Uh, you know, it's very easy to look at somebody's situation after the year is over and say, okay, this is where all of these things fit in these various boxes. I'm going to prepare this and I'm going to send it off for you. It's a different conversation to say, let me look at your life. Let me look at your family situation. Let me look at, you know, all these different pieces you know, like there's, there's strategies that people don't even know about. Like, you know, what about putting your child to work for you a few hours a week and passing some tax-free income to the household that you would be taxed heavily on, but your child is not going to be taxed at all. What if you can put money, you know, one of my missions, is, you know, our mission statement is to create generational wealth. It's to empower people with wealth creation so that this and future generations can lead a better life. Well, what if you can take some of your income and not only pass it to your child tax-free, but allow it to grow and get withdrawn tax-free when they, when they end up using it. And you could do that because once they have earnings, they can put money into a Roth IRA. So now you can pass money to them they're not paying taxes on, and then that tax-free money goes into a tax-free account that will never be taxed unless the code changes again, uh, which it's doubtful that they would undo the Roth IRA, but you never know. Um, so you know, there, that's just one of a gazillion potential strategies out there. You know, investing in real estate is another way that you can really protect a lot of cash flow that's coming in from taxes because of depreciation, because of interest expense, things like that. 
where you get positive cash flow coming in from the from the rental property, uh, but at the same time you're not showing a profit on the back end. And then there's all kinds of tax codes that allow you to roll properties into each other and and not recognize the gain and continue that 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 game as long as you're escalating the size or value of the property that you're dealing with. So um, there's a lot of different things that you can do uh, to protect yourself from from needing to pay unnecessary taxes by being strategic but if you think about it all of those things require you to do things in advance they require you know if you want to have uh and and a uh, 401k or a defined benefit contribution plan in your business you got to do that during the year it can't be at, you know after the year's over okay let's do it now um so there's a difference between tax preparing and tax planning and um and, and for, for my non-US listeners, by the way, this is, the, you know, the, the foundational concepts are the same. Maybe the specific, you know, examples I'm giving are not relevant to you, uh, but there's in, within your tax code, there's always loopholes. There's always things that you can do that are going to help you be in a better position and you need to have those conversations. Um, but more importantly than that, and this is more related to what Chelsea has been talking about, is I believe that the disorganized business owner pays more in taxes simply because there is more that happens that never gets recorded. And what happens is you pay your taxes based on revenue minus expenses. And the things that don't get recorded, what are they? They're always expenses. You're never going to not record revenue because you, your clients will kill you if you bill them for something they paid already. Right. So we all have a system in place to make sure that we're not double billing a client. We're not going after them for something they already paid. Now, you may not be doing a good job invoicing. That's a different story. You may be leaving money on the table by not invoicing. That's not going to affect your tax negatively. That's going to make it better for you because you never collected money. Um, but assuming that you're actually billing for the work that you did, you're never going to not record that revenue. But what happens is, is that you might have expenses that you pay for on your personal card. You might have expenses that you pay for with cash. And if you're not organized and keeping track of those, by the time tax time comes around, you forgot what you did in January, February, March, probably forgot what you did in November. So those things go unrecorded and they add up. And eventually that becomes that, you know, you're paying, you're paying significantly more in taxes than you needed to. And that's something that goes back to this conversation of, being organized, having somebody be on top of it, having SOPs in place that you know that you pay your bills through, that you manage these out-of-pocket expenses through, um, and you know one of the things I've learned from Michael Hyatt, um, and he he goes through this in his book Free to Focus. You have two things you can measure your activities on. One is a desirability scale: how much do I enjoy doing this, and how much do I hate doing this, right? And then the other thing is a proficiency scale. How good am I at doing this? And when it comes to bookkeeping, to managing your books, most business owners are gonna rate in the, I hate doing this and I'm not good at it scale. There are some of you who might be listening to this who love doing the books. However, look at the proficiency scale as well. How good are you at doing it? Is this the best use of your time? Uh, but for anybody who falls in the, low, the lower categories of both of those columns when it comes to this, this should be one of the first things that you outsource. This should be one of the first things you pay somebody else to do for you, not because you need to stick your head in the sand and not pay attention, but because you don't need to be busy with the minutia, the detail of how it gets entered, how it gets tracked, how you know reconciling statements. You don't have to do any of that. But what you do need to do is you need to understand what the numbers mean when the bookkeeper is done. And I think that's the missing ingredient. So even if you buy into, okay, I got to, I got to hire somebody, I got to bring somebody on. I'm going to have a bookkeeper. They're going to manage it. You know, I'm going to do my due diligence and make sure it's somebody good and, you know, and understands law firms and is going to be able to, to, to serve me properly. But when they're done, what am I doing with that? Did I just put it into an organized silo so that I can hand it off to the tax preparer at the end of the year? Or am I using that on a constant basis to check in on my goals, to check in on how we're doing, to make sure we're headed in the right direction? And understanding those numbers is really important. And all of that, my whole big 
you know, um, stage solo here to lead up to a question for Chelsea. So Chelsea, how do you help law firm owners understand their numbers? Like what, what is the report that they should be looking at? And what are the things that they should be looking at on that report that really help them understand how am I doing? Yes. So the most important report or in the one that people tend to look at the most often is definitely the income statement, right? We want to know how much money we made and we also are interested in knowing where it goes. Right. Um, but learn understanding the income statement uh, to the point of being able to use it really requires that you understand the different types of expenses. So I talked before about, you know, overhead or fixed expenses versus variable expenses and understanding that how understanding how your revenue affects each line item um, and, and being able to use it. Another area that we're sticklers in is the advertising and marketing line items. Um, it's an area that I'm passionate about because I see a lot of people throw money. I have myself have thrown money away in marketing and advertising. It's a very easy thing to do. We go into this place of uh, slot machine marketing, meaning we're putting money in, we're putting money in, and we're just hoping that one of these times something's going to produce. I'm going to get an ROI, right? But the place that we really want to get to with marketing is that vending machine method where we have proven ratios. And again, these are numbers. These are metrics. This is, this is what you should be paying attention to. Um, but we want to get to this place of the vending machine method, which, you know, we put a quarter in and we get a candy bar out. And we're pretty confident about that. And so that's something that you can, you know, monitor and use uh, on the income statement, along with uh, tracking internal metrics to compare those numbers to. Uh, another big one is understanding your margins. And we talked about that one a little bit earlier, you know, here's your revenue, but how much did it cost you directly to generate that revenue? And, and what's your gross margin for overhead and other expenses afterwards? Um, and understanding you know, where your break even point is too, which gives you a goal, right? Um, if you're just starting out and looking at your numbers and you're like, I don't even know if I'm making enough to keep going here. Well, once you have a clear income statement, you can see this is how much it costs me to operate my firm every single month at a minimum and understanding where your boundaries are financially, which then helps you to, you know, set those goals. Um, another report that, that we use that I don't see a lot of people using is a budget variance report and which requires you to actually go through and build the budget, which can be a daunting task. Um, but, you know, the big thing with the budget and all of this is really finding a place to start. That's what it's about. You find a place to start. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just need it. You need to see it on pencil and paper or, you know, it's 2020 on the computer. Um, but the importance, the value is in the follow-up every month, looking at your budget variance report and saying, this is what I thought I was going to do. This is what I actually did. And more importantly, how can I adjust my budgeting practices to be more accurate or adjust it to, you know, change the numbers around to how I actually want to see them play out. So I right, think, I think, I think I those are the big things. I think that when you're looking at something like the budget variance report and something is different than what you expected, I think the key question to ask is why? Three times, how three did, layers. How did that happen, right? Yeah. <laughs> because it, when you ask the question why, why did this number come out different, that, and you ask it deep enough, you'll uncover a problem with something you're doing in your business. Because there's a breakdown somewhere if you expected to do one thing and you did something else. And I, I'm not talking about where you're off by a couple of bucks, right? We're, we're talking about where, you know, you were planning on spending two grand on marketing and you spent five. You were planning on, you know, spending $1,500 on rent and you spent five. Like, how did that happen? Mm -hmm. Why? Right? So, so that's, you know, that's, that's really, really important. I love the slot machine vending machine analogy you gave for, for, uh, marketing and I am totally stealing it. I'm using it from now on. Um, so I, I will try to remember to use your name when I refer to it, but uh, I really love the way that you describe that. It really uh, puts it into, uh, into the, that place where people are shaking their heads saying, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and it's, you know, the, the, the vending machine methodology, you know, the, the example that you give, um, 
it's also kind of like the, you know, patience, the tortoise and the hare, you know, like it, your people are trying to game the system, trying to get things quickly. And sometimes the, you know, just moving slowly and methodically through the process and not trying to rush it is the right way to do it. And it's going to make you, you know, win at the end. Um, and, you know, so I think that's really important for us to look at and to, and to remember and to understand. Now, the truth is, is that you have to do some testing and marketing. So we're not saying don't test things, but what we are saying is, is don't go for broke. You know, don't put, don't, don't say, okay, I, you know, I've got $10,000 in the bank and I'm going to plow it all into this one thing and hope it's going to work. Um, but rather, you know, take your time and test things and, and look for those early indicators. Is this working? Is it not working? And do I need to tweak or do I need to abandon this particular, uh, you know, thing that we're doing, this particular method? Um, so I love that. And by the way, the income statement might also be called the PNL or the profit and loss statement. So for those of you who are like, what's the income statement? How come I don't have that? Uh, there's, there's another, you know, terminology to, to refer to it. Um, but I love, uh, I, and, and I want to go into just for a moment, this fixed versus variable. I, I, I you know, for, for us nerds, um, we understand what it is, but there are probably people on the other end that are like, um, I don't understand this thing between fixed and variable. What does that mean? I know the ter what the terms mean, but what does that mean when it comes down to it? So um, I'm going to throw an example out there for, for our listeners. Um, you have rent, which uh, Chelsea has been kind enough to tell us is a fixed expense, right? What that means is, is that every month you're paying that rent, whether or not you have clients, whether or not you have cash, whether or not, you know, you, you have to pay that amount no matter what. Um, a variable expense is a, an expense that's going to vary based on the amount of work that you're doing. So um, uh, one good example of that is marketing. If your marketing is on point, then you know that every dollar in at, into marketing might be bringing four or five dollars of revenue into the business. So if you go from $10,000 a month to $20,000 a month, you know that your marketing budget is going to go from $2,500 to $5,000. Right or twenty or two thousand to 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 four thousand. I gave a one to five ratio. So twenty percent of the revenue is going to marketing. Now I'm not saying that that's a healthy number. Don't take don't, don't start backing into okay. If I have ten thousand a month, I'm spending two thousand on marketing. I'm just giving an example where something would should have a direct correlation to the amount of revenue coming in, and and it could vary on other things. In other words, it doesn't have to necessarily vary based on revenue, um, but it varies based on something, some other indicator, some other factor of what's happening in the firm. Um, people's another thing, although people want to, if you hire somebody full time, they're, they become a fixed expense, even though they're variable. So until that person is at capacity, they're there, they're a fixed expense. But then when you go past them, you need to bring on the next person, it's now variable again. So they are technically a variable expense, but you kind of need to look at it like, okay, I'm already committed to this, you know, this scenario. Now I need to fill into that. So how does this play out in your business planning and understanding your business. Well, let's say your rent is $10,000 a month. You're going to have to pay $10,000 a month, whether you bring in 10,000 in revenue or a hundred thousand in revenue. So the more revenue that you bring in, the lower the percentage of cost is tied to that fixed expense. And what happens is, is that each fixed expense gives you a certain amount of capacity that you're able to produce. So your office might have room for five people. Well, you have capacity to produce the work that five people can produce. As soon as you get to a sixth person, you need a bigger office. That has to change. So your, your key as, as a business owner is to try to maximize the capacity that you have because that's where the profit is made. If you get a five-person office and you have one person in it, it's going to be very hard to make money because that person can only produce X amount of revenue. And most of that revenue is going to be going to that expense because you have too much capacity. So you need to look at fixed expenses with what capacity does that give you to do and how do I maximize that? And that's the, the that is the profit zone. That's where you're going to make money. So, um, and I think that we can, we can have a whole nother episode just talking about fixed and variable expenses and how to measure them and how to, you know, how to go about that. Um, but I think that that should hopefully help clear up what does it mean and why is that important for me to understand uh, when it comes to that conversation. 
Um, Chelsea, anything you want to add specifically regarding fixed and variable expenses that I might have missed in that explanation that can help clarify things for people? I know that was that was a good explanation. Um, it made me think of there a story. So I had a client, and you know when we go into business for ourselves, especially lawyers, because historically that's what you do. You find a brick and mortar, you put your firm name in vinyl on the front window, you make it beautiful, extravagant. There's this belief that we have to have this physical office in order to really be a real law firm, right? Um, and so I had this client and she was renting two spaces. And when we started going through her budget and looking at how her business was structured, um, after all was said and done, she really didn't need that second space. She could get everything going smoothly with really plenty of room into that one space. And so, you know, she was able to drop that second rent expense and move into this space and make it work. So she had some part-time people, but it was a matter of coordinating schedules and making sure that things were available. Um, but it really cut her expenses for her. And you know, this plays well into what's going on right now. So while we're recording this, we're you know experiencing COVID. And one of the things that I, one of the positive things I think that happened in the legal industry with COVID is that it forced people to really open up their minds to things that they did not believe could happen. And what I mean by that is we see people working remotely, you know, and I have plenty of clients who work remotely and have been for years, but then, and I'm, you run into this too, I'm sure. Then we talk to the attorney who still has filing cabinets and the receptionist is not, receptionist is not 100% sure how to get onto a video link you know, and my heart really goes out to them after all of this. Um, but my hope is that, you know, we're really challenging what we were told is how to run a law firm and becoming more efficient with our time and our resources. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I actually had a, an, an attorney like that here in, in New York City that I met with and really successful um, law firm and, you know, uh, probably doing two to three million in revenue with, you know, with, with, with a, a nice profit margin, um, but they didn't have a computer in the office, like literally not a computer in the office. And, um, you know, this was when I, when I first started working with law firms and I gave them a proposal to uh, basically help them upgrade, you know, and, and implement um, everything. So practice management software and bookkeeping software and uh, your payment collection software, uh, you know, website, all the things that they need to, to basically come from the, you know, um, I have to say the 19th century into the 21st, right? Um, and uh, at the end of the day, they, they did not take me up on it. They didn't move forward with it. And, um, you know, like you said, you know, heart going out to them. I, I think that they did fine through the pandemic. I think that they managed, um, you know, because their clients still have their cell phone number and they still, you know, so they still do business, but, uh, you know, it, it, it couldn't have been easy for them. Uh, and maybe now, you know, the, the, that expense, you know, that expense would have, you know, in hindsight would have made a lot of sense for them. Um, but, you know, you can't change people. You can't make them think differently. The only thing that we can do is we can try to highlight where those erroneous ways might be, hi highlight where those where there's room for improvement, and hope that some people see it, some people latch onto it, and some people make a change. Uh, you know, and that's with with this podcast. You know, I, I can only hope that one listener out there has improved their life because of this hour that we spent together. Because otherwise, why are we doing it, right? Um, so with every single episode I put out there, I'm always thinking of that one person, you know, what, who is that person I'm going to change? What is their life going to look like after we're done with this conversation? And, you know, hopefully we did that, um, for somebody out there, uh, Chelsea, we're, you know, we're out of time, so we're going to wrap it up here. Uh, how can people best follow up with you? Is there somewhere that you'd like to, to send our audience if they want to find out more about you or take the next step to, uh, you know, work with you or have a conversation with you? Yeah. So we, I mean, on our, every social platform. So I typically tell people you can go to our website, yourcoursesolution.com, and it's got links to all of our other uh, social media outlets. And then for the ladypreneurs out there, we have lp-3.squarespace.com uh, is where we're at right now. 
Okay, so we'll link that up in the show notes for you. And Chelsea, oh my gosh, you have to get a real domain name for LP3. I know. <laughs> um, off, of, off of that dot square, squarespace.com. So I'm sure that that will happen soon. But I also know we recently started a book club for, lawyer, for lawyers um, called The Reader's Nook. And I know that you started a book club as well. So why don't you plug that here um, on the episode as well for anybody who wants to join? Yes, and LP3 is about a week old, so we're uh, still wrapping some things up. But the book club is a Facebook group. group. It's called Self Wealth Book Club for Lady Preneurs. Awesome. And um, when you say for Lady Preneurs, does that mean that if a guy tries to get in, you're saying, no, sorry, it's for ladies only? I'm sorry, but yes. <laughs> Not a problem. I just want to make that clear because, um, you know, uh, so people get offended when they take an action and they're denied. So we clear that up here and this way, you know, um, the guys know to just ignore it and, um, and not do anything about it. And this way we keep everybody happy. Uh, all right, Chelsea, it's been great. A wonderful conversation. I appreciate you being here on the show. Folks, go check Chelsea out. We, we're going to link all those links up in the show notes for you. And, um, you know, more, more than anything, if there's one takeaway that, you know, that you can have from this episode, I think it's just getting organized and knowing where you're at because everything starts there. And from there, you, you have the ability to then create a budget, to look at your numbers, to uh, forecast what you want to have happen. None of that can happen if you don't have a starting point, if you're disorganized. And, you know, we procrastinate that which is uncomfortable. And procrastinating your take, managing your finances is like an epidemic when it comes to business owners. And, um, you know, you got to start wearing your mask. You got to start um, taking those precautions to make sure that you avoid the plague. So go and get yourself a bookkeeper, whether it's Chelsea, whether it's our, our, you know, our accounting firm here, Dream Builder Financial, um, or somebody local to you or somebody that else that you have a connection with. It doesn't matter. I don't care where you get it done, but just get your books in order so that you can take that next step with your business. Um, so uh, we'll catch you on a Tuesday. Um, you know, we do a solo episode every Tuesday, an interview every Thursday. Uh, so I'm looking forward to my next conversation with you. If this is your first time listening to the podcast uh, and you want to know when we release a new episode, which is twice a week, hit that subscribe button. Make sure that we're showing up in your podcast player every time a new episode comes out. We'd love to have you as a loyal listener. If you've been listening for a while and you're really getting value out of the show, please take a moment to rate and review us. That goes a long way for people who are thinking about listening to the show. They're looking for something to, to, to check out and to try. Um, and if you've been enjoying this, don't take that opportunity away from them by not um, by not leaving us a rating and review. We need more numbers there to help it become something that people you know, say, oh, look, this one is popular. Let me go check it out. So um, that's it. Have a great day. Chelsea, this has been fun. And I'm looking forward to future conversations that I'm sure we'll have uh, after a meeting uh, for the first time today. Yes, thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. That's it for this week's episode of Profit With Law. If you have enjoyed the show, please consider sharing it with at least one person. Imagine how many lives we can change if we each shared this episode. Another way to share the episode is on social media. We appreciate your support and look forward to you joining us again next week.